Hello and welcome to our second tutorial for Widener's ME474 Finite Element course. Uh, we will be working this time in Abacus CAE Student Edition 2017. So for those of you who are using a different version of the software, uh, I'm sure most of these buttons and features are still located in the same spot. However, you may notice some differences if you are not using the Student Edition 2017. For workshop number two, the problem that we will be solving is shown here. Uh, this is uh, actually from last year's workshop, but it's still the same problem. You'll see here uh, it is a small aluminum block that is 300 millimeters by 600 millimeters with a 40 millimeter diameter hole in the center. And the idea is that it's being loaded into a tensile machine and we're going to be applying a load in both directions and uh, I said here that uh, for the first part of this problem we'll assume that the clamps span the entire width and when we're done uh, we can play around with different size clamps and uh, see what impact that may have on the stress that we're getting. Uh, also the goal for this particular workshop is to take advantage of symmetry so we will talk a little bit about symmetry and I'll show you how to use those uh, and uh, how that can definitely uh, shorten up the solver time for your problems. And in this case, especially with the student edition, uh, it can help us to reduce the number of nodes and elements that we need and be able to effectively use the student edition. So let's begin the problem. We will open up our uh, CAE student edition 2017. Uh, initially, you should come to a screen like this, uh, although you will have to choose the first option for a standard or explicit model. Uh, and then your window should look like the one that I'm showing you here. Uh, it is important to keep in mind that uh, in Abacus, there are no specific units. So you, are, uh, you have to keep track of your own units. And in this problem, since the uh, distances or the, uh, the lengths were given in terms of millimeters, we will be using uh, millimeters and newtons and megapascals for our base units. So first, uh, we will be working in the part module. So for this, we'll start out the very first step with creating a part. And in our problem, we're going to make this a 2D deformable shell part uh, since we're not necessarily concerned about the depth. We're going to be assuming that the stress is constant. Uh, throughout the depth of the problem. So we're really just going to be uh, modeling a surface and we're going to be uh, using that uh, those results to uh, indicate what would be happening throughout the thickness. So we can go ahead and give our part a name. I'm going to call it block. And if we want to, we can update this size since we're talking about a sample that is 300 by 600. Uh, why don't we go ahead and make this size a thousand just so that way we are uh, generally fitting in the grid that will be provided in the sketcher. So we'll go ahead and say continue. It takes us to our sketch window. Now if we want to take advantage of symmetry uh, in this particular problem, if we go back to the problem statement, you'll see that uh, we can take advantage of quarter symmetry actually. That if I drew a line straight down the middle, the top and the bottom would look exactly the same. And if I drew a line straight up and down at the center, the left and the right would look exactly the same. So we're going to go ahead and just model this top left quadrant here and use symmetry in two directions to create the rest of the problem. So we're going to go ahead, like I said, and do the upper left quadrant uh, for our particular problem here. So we're first going to start out by drawing a rectangle. Uh, for future use in the problem, uh, especially when we go to do the results, if we want to quickly and easily mirror what our solution looks like across some other axes to, uh, uh, for illustration purposes, uh, I'm going to go ahead and try to draw this upper left part here, so that way when we do the uh, default mirror features in the results, we'll be able to uh, quickly do that without having to make a lot of adjustments. So what that means is, I'm going to draw my rectangle starting here at 0, 0. And since the problem statement said it is 300 by 600, if I'm only drawing the upper left, that means that I need something that's going to be 150 by 300. So we're going to go 300 units in the negative x direction and 150 units in the positive y direction. So we'll end up with something that looks like this. 
Uh, next, we will need to consider the hole that we put at the center. So let's go ahead and create a circle. Uh, it is located then also at 0, 0. It's going to be right there at the middle. And for the perimeter point, uh, the problem statement said the diameter of this hole is 40 millimeters. So if we draw this circle to go out to 20, 0, that will give us a uh, diameter of 40. So it's a relatively small hole, uh, but uh, that's what the problem called for. So now we need to uh, trim everything here so that way we're just left with the you know, most of the rectangle there and that little cutout. So we're going to use the auto trim feature. When I click on that, Abacus says select the segment of a curve to delete. So we want to delete this part of the circle, this part of the circle, and then these two lines inside so that we are just left with the uh, little quarter circle here cut out. Uh, which again, once we go to use symmetry, will become a full circle in the problem. So we are all done trimming. So I will select the red X here, and then it still says sketch the section. We are all done sketching. So I will say done, and here is my quarter symmetry part. Okay, for the part module, uh, this is the last step that we needed, the only step that we needed. Um, not really a, a strong need here for creating sets, uh, but uh, if we do decide to come back and do the uh, problem with uh, different size clamps, we can uh, come back to this part and we will uh, create some partitions if we need to in order to do that. So after part, we'll move down to property. The first step in uh, properties is going to be creating a material. So we were told that this uh, problem is using aluminum and we're going to enter in just some very basic elastic properties for aluminum so we'll go down here to mechanical and under elasticity we will select elastic and the only values that we need again if we are using millimeters that means that our uh, modulus values are going to be entered in megapascals so a typical value for aluminum might be something on the order of 70 gigapascals. So we'll be entering 70,000 megapascals. And for Poisson's ratio, uh, we can choose a appropriate number, something around the order of maybe 0 0.22. And we'll say OK. So we now have created that material. However, at this point, we haven't actually applied it to the part. We need to create a section. So again, we can give it any name we want. I will call it block. And in this case, it's a solid homogeneous. That's what we are uh, modeling here. And we'll see that my material populates itself right away since it's the only material there, aluminum. And we're going to go ahead and say OK. The next step is to actually assign that section to my part. So we're going to click on Assign Section. Yeah, because the bottom says Select Regions to be Assigned to Section. So we're going to choose the whole part. And we'll say Done. And then we'll see once again, this is the only section that shows up since I've only created one. If we had more than one, uh, we could uh, go ahead and uh, choose from our dropdown. But in this case, we only have the one. So I will say OK. And we'll see that the uh, part has changed colors, indicating that the property has been assigned. So at this point, uh, those are the only steps we needed to do in the property module. We aren't uh, really taking advantage of any of these other profiles or uh, composite layups or any of those features. So at this point, our properties are all defined. So next, we'll move down to assembly. Uh, this is always the step that I find uh, students uh, forget, is that even if it is only one part, we always need to create an assembly. So we'll go ahead and create our assembly with just one instance. We'll leave it as dependent. We can just go ahead and mesh the part when we get to that step. So I'll say OK. And here is our completed assembly. As I indicated in class, uh, we will do some assignments and some workshops in the near future where we've got multiple parts, and I will show you some of these buttons over here for patterning and translating. Uh, but for the time being, uh, this assembly happens to just be this one part. So next up is the step module. <clears throat> Another part that is uh, frequently forgotten uh, by students is that uh, we always have to at least create one step. 
Uh, Abacus only includes an initial step, which really just handles uh, boundary conditions and initial conditions, uh, but doesn't take care of any, you can't apply any loads or displacements or rotations within those uh, features. So we always have to create at least one step. So we'll go ahead in here and create a step. Uh, we can give it any name you want. Maybe in this case, we'll call it uh, loading. And for our problem, we aren't uh, looking at it as a dynamic system. We are just looking at a static problem. So we can stick with our general static. And for the most part, we can go ahead and accept the defaults here. Uh, nothing that we really need to change. If you wanted to be able to see the uh, problem animation, uh, different sizes, you could go ahead and change your increment size here if you wanted. Um, I uh, Maybe we'll go ahead and do that. I'll just set this to be something like 0 0.2 with a maximum of 0 0.2. So that means that since on the first step here, I had said our total time period is going to be 1, by setting this initial increment size to 0 0.2, that means that it's going to take at least five increments to solve the problem. So if I go to animate these results later on or look at uh, you know any incremental values along the way, I will have a few uh, options to look at there rather than just solving the problem in one, uh, one quick step. So, um, so that's all I really needed here. I'll say OK. And as we can see over here now in my dropdown, in addition to the initial step, I now have a loading step as well. Uh, so we don't need to make any changes to our field outputs or history outputs. I'm really just interested in uh, maybe displacements or perhaps the uh, stress contours. Uh, nothing that would be unusual that we would need to specifically tell Abacus that I wanted to keep track of. So we're done with steps. For interactions, uh, once again, this particular problem, since we're only dealing with one part, uh, we don't really have any interactions to work with. We're not dealing with friction. We're not dealing with uh, rigid bodies. We're not dealing with a tie constraint in this particular problem. Uh, these are all features that I will cover in future workshops for the course. Uh, but for this particular problem, we won't need to make use of the interaction module. So if I now move down to the load module, uh, we will have a few items that we need to include in this step, including our new feature that we're talking about tonight, which would be the symmetry condition. So let's start out by defining those uh, symmetry conditions. Uh, you'll see that we need to apply symmetry on this face over here, saying that there should be additional material in the x direction. And I also need to apply it on this face down here, saying that there should be additional material in the y direction. So let's go ahead and create the boundary condition. For this first one, we will deal with the X symmetry face. So I will just call it X symmetry, or X sim. And we will choose the symmetry uh, type for that particular uh, boundary condition as well. And when I say continue, we'll see that Abacus comes up and it wants me to select region for the boundary condition. So when I'm uh, dealing with symmetry in the X direction, it's normal to that face. So for this face, my x-axis is normal to that face, and that's the symmetry condition that I want to define. Uh, so I'm going to choose that face and say done. And if you ever get confused on which symmetry it is that we want to use, when I look at x symmetry, it's telling me that u1, so displacement in the one direction or the x direction, is going to be zero. So that makes sense because material that's on this face Theoretically, there should be material directly next door to it constraining it from moving in the x direction. As opposed to this face down here, uh, it can move in the x direction, but there should be material directly below it preventing it from moving in the y direction. So this face would be y symmetry. This face would be x symmetry. So if you ever get confused, just look at what values are about to be set equal to 0 and see if that makes sense for the face that you're selecting. So for this problem, since I said X symmetry and I selected that face over here on the far right, I'm going to go ahead and choose my X symmetry boundary condition and say OK. And so now I can see the arrows indicating that I've applied a boundary condition to that edge. We will go ahead and do the same thing on the bottom edge to create my Y symmetry. So we'll say continue. I'm going to select this bottom edge. Oops. I'm going to select just the bottom edge, say done, 
and this one needs to be Y symmetry. Okay, so we have now created our two symmetry boundary conditions. In addition, I will also need to apply a displacement uh, simulating the clamps. So if we go back quickly to the problem statement, what I had said here was that we can apply different amounts of displacement. So again, maybe this is a reason to use uh, smaller increments within that step so that that way I can go ahead and see what the uh, stresses look like at various different levels of displacement. So we will set our displacement, uh, we can choose a number. So this, uh, anytime we're dealing with displacements, that is defined as a boundary condition as opposed to uh, defining a load, which would be handled under our uh, load, create load feature. So we're gonna go ahead and do create boundary condition. Uh, this one we can call maybe uh, attention. And we're gonna be using the displacement feature this time. So we'll say continue. And I wanna apply it on just this far left edge. This is the edge that is within that clamp. So I'm gonna click on that edge and I'm gonna say done. And I want to apply that tension in this case in the negative X direction. Since my axis is shown over here, positive X is going to the right. So I wanna stretch this in the negative X direction. So I'm gonna click U1 here and I'm gonna say I wanna go negative 20 millimeters. So that's gonna be my total displacement overall is 20 millimeters. Uh, since I've forced the problem to solve in smaller increments, this is going to give me the opportunity to see those displacements in smaller scales uh, so I could get some sense of uh, seeing how the stress builds up in our problem. Okay, so we will use uh, 20 millimeter displacement. And I can see when I say OK that I get feedback here that these arrows are pointing in the direction that I was hoping. And uh, that uh, gives me confidence now that I've set that problem up correctly. So that's going to do it for our load module. From here next we can move down to mesh. So it's always a good idea to check the element type. So we're going to go ahead there first, the assign element type. Oops, and I always forget this step here that since we chose uh, dependent, we need to first change to part for our mesh. And now I'll choose the assign element type. And Abacus wants me to select the region for those uh, to assign element type, so I'm going to choose the whole part and say done. And I'll see that uh, you know various different options show up. By default, it has chosen plain stress, so I'm satisfied with that. But we could uh, it's always good to check and just make sure that the correct element types are about to be assigned. So we're going to say OK. And next up is uh, applying the seeds or the nodes. So first, I want to show you maybe the way that you might want to try to do this part. And then I'm going to go and show you how we can try to refine that mesh around the, uh, the hole especially. So if I just try to do this using the global seed method, you'll see here by default, Abacus is suggesting a uh, global node size of 28. So if I say apply here, you'll see how it's going to shape up. It's a uh, pretty coarse. Uh, we are using the student edition, so we are somewhat limited. But if I were to change this to maybe, uh, I don't know, 15, and say apply, you'll see that I have a fair number of seeds and I'll say okay, but I only have two seeds or three seeds, two elements along this uh, circular region here. So if I say okay and I go ahead and mesh the part, what I see is that my cutout here ends up not being very circular any longer. So if I want to try to maintain that, what I can do is come back in here to use the seed edges feature and if I click on just that circular region and say done, Abacus allows me now to uh, define specifically on particular edges or all edges. I can either change the size for just that one edge or I can come in here and say by number and I can tell Abacus, you know what, on that particular circle I want to make sure we've got uh, eight, eight elements. So I can refine that a little bit more. And if I say OK here, it's going to delete my mesh, but I can see that it has applied uh, different seeds here on different colors so that it's understood that it's going to be at a different ratio than the rest of the problem. But I can see that that looks a little bit more refined. So if I say OK, 
and I mesh the part and say yes, now I can see that I actually get a much, uh, a much more refined uh, mesh pattern around that particular section. I've created 250 elements, so we'll have to see if that fits. Uh, I think that sounds like that might just barely fit within the uh, student edition, uh, but we'll find out. If it uh, triggers an error, we can always come back and uh, coarsen up some of the mesh in the other areas. There are additional tricks that we could use here if we wanted to to try to uh, straighten out some of the mesh in these other regions. Uh, again, in some future problems, we will work through that a bit more. Uh, but we could use partitions here if we wanted to, to essentially cut the problem up and just have the mesh in this region be a little bit deformed and the rest of it could be perfectly square if we uh, decided to do that. But uh, I think for this particular problem, that is probably not necessary. Okay, so at this point, I am uh, satisfied with that mesh for, for our purposes. Uh, again, being constrained by the student edition, you know, maybe we, we could, uh, if we were unconstrained, perhaps we would go ahead and refine that some more, but I think for us, we're satisfied. So we're going to come down here next to job, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and create a new job, and we can call it, uh, we'll just call it like work two, for workshop number two. And for our case, since we're not doing any parallelization or anything fancy, we can just accept all the default information for the job. I'll say OK. If I open up the job manager, I can see that uh, my job shows up here for work two. <clears throat> and so far, we haven't run it. So I'm going to go ahead and say submit. Obviously, I've done this at some point in the past. So we'll just go ahead and overwrite that. And right now, it says my job is submitted. Submitted, submitted. If I go to monitor, I can watch this step. And apparently it didn't really like uh, that file that I was overriding. I must have still had it open from before. So maybe we'll have to give this one a different name. Uh, there you go. We will uh, just create a new job here. And let's come back in here to my monitor. And we'll see that time it ran successfully. You'll also see that it did it in some smaller increments. So here's that 0 0.2 that I capped it at. So it forced Abacus to solve that in five smaller increments, even though it's under one step. So what that means is when I go to look at the results, I'll be able to see the uh, displacement slowly being applied over five even increments, uh, and that's going to let me get, uh, get my answers. Of course, now it's still trying to get me to do some re reboot here on some updates. Um, we're going to go ahead and just close that out. So I'm going to dismiss my window here, and I'm going to look at my results. And so here is my original shape undeformed and if I look at the deformed I can see that I'm definitely stretching that problem out. You'll see it does have a scale factor turned on right now so that it's a little uh, magnified but uh, still it, it certainly looks like symmetry is being used. We can see these faces are remaining uh, square so it's not uh, violating any of these uh, symmetry boundary conditions. If I bring up my contour I can see also that uh, I, I've got a, a pretty cool looking stress contour. We would be expecting to see some different stress concentrations perhaps around the hole. Uh, if I use the uh, window, the little buttons up here, I can actually step through that stress. So here it is uh, when my increment is zero. If I use just the little buttons here, I can say next. So I can see what happened when I uh, had applied just 20% of the total displacement. And then I can step it up a little bit more, and step it up a little bit more, and step it up a little bit more. So we can see those numbers uh, slowly building up. The contour itself actually had kind of uh, stayed more or less the same, and you'll see the deformation scale factor keeps changing. So that's why it kind of looks like nothing is even changing. Uh, so that's uh, a little bit misleading there, perhaps. But um, 
we could also control that a little bit if we wanted to. We could make this just a uniform scale factor of one. And uh, I could go ahead and now if I use those arrows, you'll see that I can actually see it deforming differently if I just force it to do that rather than uh, having it auto compute. So, uh, so we can see it looks like it worked. Uh, we, we've got uh, a nice stress contour here and some good uh, deformations. If we wanted to now, we could go back and modify, uh, you know, how much or yeah, how much of that edge is being captured by the clamp. So to do that, uh, there's a few different ways, but maybe the easiest way would be if we just were to partition using a sketch. It's telling me now that uh, this is going to invalidate some of my mesh, so I'm going to have to go back and uh, do a few different steps here to make sure we haven't uh, wrecked our model, but that's okay, so we'll say okay. And <clears throat> what I need to do now is just basically draw a line, and uh, I'm just going to choose an arbitrary spot, but we could use... Uh, dimensions if we wanted to and uh, be able to control exactly where we put that line. So I'm just going to draw a line straight across, um, you know, roughly maybe, uh, I don't know, two thirds of the way up or so. <clears throat> so now it's asking me if I'm all done. So I'm going to say I'm done and I'll see now that I've got this line straight across. But what it allows me to do is to select these edges separately from each other. Okay. So that is uh, done for the part. Let's go back to property. It certainly looks like my sections are still applied, uh, so that, uh, that seems good. But if we're confused, we can always come back in here and just edit that section and make sure. Again, it looks like everything is nice and highlighted, so we don't really have a problem there. So my properties still appear to be okay. The assembly and the step, those should all be the same. We're going to come down here to load. And uh, let's go ahead and open up our boundary condition manager. And we're just going to check all three of these to make sure we haven't uh, violated any of those ones that we wanted to. So if I first, uh, for tension, let's highlight that one and click on edit. And we can see that we're still highlighting this whole face over here. So what I would like to do is only apply it to just this lower region down here. So now we've pretended like that clamp has gotten smaller and we're only clamping this middle section of my part. So if I say done, and I accept it over here, I'll see now some of those arrows disappeared and we're uh, now only pulling on this section down here. If I check on my X symmetry condition, that looks like it's okay, but let's just click on edit real quick. And yes, it appears that we're still grabbing that whole side. And if I check Y symmetry, we'll do the same thing. But yes, it looks like we're still grabbing that entire side. So I'm satisfied with those uh, boundary conditions remaining the same. And now we have uh, reduced how much of this face is being uh, is being grabbed in that clamp. We will have to come back and remesh again. So if I uh, click on the uh, oh yeah, and I still have to change it to parts. <clears throat> if I do my global, I'll see uh, that actually all those seeds are still there. So I don't necessarily need to change anything, but I do need to remesh. So I'll say yes. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, but you can see now actually at the top that this whole region has uh, gone back to being very square. So you could imagine if we dropped a line straight down over here as well, we could uh, constrain or confine the area that's sort of misshapen to just a small box, and the whole rest of the problem could be nice and square if we so desired. Uh, I, I still don't think that's really necessary in this particular problem, but uh, one could do that if you wanted to. Okay, so now with the uh, mesh changed, we can come back to job. And uh, we're going to have to create another new job. And this one I'll just call it uh, 474 work 2 underscore 2, so part 2. I'll say continue. We'll accept all the defaults. And I'm going to submit this job next. I can come on here to monitor and just check and make sure that uh, everything is running okay. We could see it started up Abacus Standard, solved it in our five little increments for one step. So just like before, we're going to get the same little breakdown of even uh, displacement. If I look at my results, I can see here's my undeformed shape and here's my deformed shape. And yeah, it looks like uh, 
our mesh isn't really quite refined enough. We've got this uh, pretty fun looking hourglassing going on up here in the top section. Uh, maybe that's not too unexpected because we've got a very sharp change here between something controlled by a boundary condition and something that's sort of free to move. So we've got some interesting uh, hourglass buckling going on. But uh, it still at least shows our, our point of what I was hoping to try to show is that if we look at our stresses now, we're going to have a very different contour than what we had when we clamped the whole edge. And again, we can, you know, step through this if we wanted to. We can go through each increment by increment. We can see how that's building up differently than it did before. Uh, so it definitely has an effect on the problem. It uh, changes the contour and it changes the, uh, the way that that problem performs. And clearly it also creates additional concerns that maybe we didn't have before on mesh refinement and uh, how we would deal with the uh, hourglassing effect that we've got on that particular edge now. But um, anyway, that's uh, the examples I wanted to demonstrate. So what we were able to see in this workshop is the use of uh, symmetry boundary conditions. That would be something new. Uh, we also worked with the uh, displacement boundary conditions. Last time we only did uh, forces, so we, we looked at how to control displacements. Uh, we also used the partition tool for the first time, uh, so that's a very handy tool to know, and uh, especially in, in cases where you need to uh, create different properties in different sections, or uh, if you want to uh, create just one part and uh, partition it. The uh, assumption anytime you partition is that the two connected surfaces there are going to be perfectly tied together. So if there is a time where you can create just one part that's really meant to be two parts and you do it with a partition, you can avoid the need for uh, the tie constraint, which we will talk about in future workshops, uh, but just something to consider as well. So I hope that you found this workshop useful. Uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, or uh, you can always leave comments under the video as well, but uh, I do encourage you to reach out and ask questions. And uh, again, hope you found this useful and uh, look forward to workshop number three coming up soon.